how you're gonna walk through this world. It's so easy to misstep. How are you gonna walk through the world? So easy to screw it up. You gotta rise like the sun does every day. Rise up, look above. The light feels something like love. Hi, I'm Shelley Liedahl from Lovely Lady Smith on Vancouver Island. And this is my literary podcast, Something Like Love. This is Season 3, Episode 9. This season, I've been focusing on travel and exploration. In 2006, I spent six weeks in a cabin in the northern Georgia woods at the Hambidge Retreat Center, and that part of the United States was another world to me. I saw a black rat snake stretch right across the road. I drank sweet tea and ate grits, chitlins, and black-eyed peas. I saw Nazi memorabilia at flea markets. And I met Billy Redden, the man who played the part of the banjo-playing boy in the movie Deliverance. Side note, I've since learned that he wasn't playing the banjo at all. There was someone playing it for him in that scene. I also met some super kind, generous, and brilliant people in that part of the world. In this episode, I'll share the fictional story I wrote while I was in Raven Gap. I call it Raven County, and it was published in my short story collection, Listen Honey, released in 2012 by DC Books. Easy to find online if you fancy getting a copy. To set the mood, let's kick things off with a little bluegrass. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to my home on God's celestial shore. school bell rings, the exodus occurs. Emma remains seated and imagines the heaviest element leaching up from the floorboards, soaking through shoes and skin and invading her circuitry of veins. The lethargic climb through well-muscled calves, along the supple thighs, inside her complicated middle parts, navigating the twisty intestines, coloring the tendrils in her chest, weighting each arm, bangled wrists, hands, until it reaches the restless fingertips on the black-lined page of her notebook. What is the heaviest naturally occurring element? Ah, yes, uranium, atomic number 92. And a trick question she is prepared for, the heaviest man-made element Unonoctium, element 118. That should impress him. Chemistry's the last hard class before she graduates, thank you, Jesus. She would pass without the extra tutoring, but she's asked especially for it, and didn't teacher seem pleased? She thought so. She nudges a pen off the desk and, aware that he's furtively watching from his own desk, bends so slowly to recover it, one might believe she suffered a trauma to her back or neck. Outside, buses pull away with their raucous charges and nose toward the Blue Ridge Mountains. Someone's car alarm is bleating. Closer still, one fly has mounted another in the corner of the window. The female's hind legs steadily twitch. Emma is hyper-aware and soon teacher's shoes, oxblood, 
leather, are drumming down the aisle toward her. He stops, three desks away, and asks, Would you prefer to come to the front, or shall I slide a chair over? She considers the angular shape of him, tall enough to hunt geese with a rake, brown eyes a hue lighter and less intent than her own, a scar like a miniature witching rod beneath the right eye, neat black brows, newly sunburned throat, pressed shirt, sleeves rolled above slender forearms, moons of perspiration, a book reader, nothing like the men around here. He's closer to her age than her father's, she decides. Someone who'd take dance lessons before his wedding, write a sappy song for his wife and croon it at the reception, nervous fingers plucking the guitar chords too quickly, his voice suddenly boyish and shy, as if even it is unprepared to make the commitment. Your desk will be fine. She zips a pencil into its case, flutters through her notes, stares at him with the intensity of one boring a hole in wood. Mr. Hamilton turns away first, and she understands. This is the beginning. It's begun. There's Emma again, roaring up the back steps, expertly missing the gap where a board punched through years ago. The screen door opens with a sound like a child saying, Wee! She wings her books and checks beneath the oilcloth table inside the pantry. I'm home, Varlene. She removes the rag rug that covers the cellar's trapdoor and calls down, Where's my big sister hiding today? But Varlene's not playing. Emma finds her on the sofa, calico skirt flipped back, deer legs splayed, eyes gridlocked on the copper-colored ceiling stains, as if some happily ever after is cinematically playing out between the rough beams and cobwebs. What did I say about that, Leany? She claps above her sister's vacant face to break the trance. Get your fingers out of your business! Varlene adjusts her skirt and arranges herself against the arm of the couch like a starlet. Emma collapses at the other end, another night of twisting up in the sheets. Crazy dreams, her dad's diagnosed with cancer, and the doctor's making her responsible for telling him she'd give her eye teeth for some real sleep. Her sister thunks her bare feet, too swollen now for anything but flip-flops, into her lap. Shoot, the girls tried painting her toenails with whiteout, and she smeared it onto her dirty toes. Shouldn't have left it out, Emma chides herself. Varlene rolls up and sits on her knees, her face close to her sister's. Know what I haven't had for a long time, Em? Her breath's like sour apples, Emma thinks, and wonders if this can be blamed on changing hormones. Teacher would know. What's that? she asks, kneading her own temples. An ice cream sandwich. Hop, hop. Can we go to town? Pretty please with a cherry on top? Varlene bounces on the sofa, and the springs protest. A mouse family inside, Emma thinks. Least that's what it sounds like. Not before supper. You know the rules. Daddy'll be home soon. I'll make something to eat, then we'll see. Maybe he'd like ice cream, too. The ribbed upholstery has impressed a pattern on Varlene's cheek, like a tribal scar, Emma thinks, or a birthmark. Chocolate or maple walnut? Them's his special favorites. Those. Those are his favorites. The clock chimes. Emma stands and hauls her sister up by an elbow. Come on, time to start supper. The girls are the same height when the blades of their backs meet and they gaze sideways at the bathroom mirror. People say they could be twins. Not true, Emma thinks. It's just the hair. If not swept into an elastic or twisted into a single braid like a show horse tail, their bored straight locks graze their waistbands. She's grateful her hair's a reasonable brown. Varlene's is as white blonde as the day she took her sweet time being born. Toddlers and old women can't resist touching it. Gotta pee first, Varlene says, holding herself. She clumsily runs toward the bathroom and does not close the door. And then what? Emma calls after her. She consciously straightens as she returns to the darkening kitchen, walks as if 
balancing her chemistry text on her head. Poor postures, repulsive. The woman who birthed them, an unsolicited ghost who infrequently strobes across her thoughts, habitually drew her shoulders in. She was, Emma recalls, beginning to resemble a question mark. Varlene, what do you do after using the toilet? The girl shouts back, wash my hands real good. Emma watches transient shadows creep across the stacked plates and mugs cupped inside each other. The three good pots and cast iron pan, the brown Betty teapot with the lid that doesn't fit right. She sniffs the air, notes the trash is right to the top of the can. Must dump it, she thinks, and presses her forehead to the window. She doesn't put much stock in Christian prayer, but if she did, this would be the hour for a little help from on high. The worst thing has happened. No, death would be worse. Varlene's, their dad's, but this was close. The second worst thing. She nudges the window open to maximum height and secures it with the stick they keep on the sill. Fresh air in great gulps. That's better. The woods are alive, undulating. Chattering squirrels animate sycamores, maples, and hemlock, scattering brushwood in irregular showers onto the thick mulch of leaves. Sunlight bleeds through wherever able. Pretty, she thinks. The woods often beckon. She likes to gather snapped branches from the understory and weave rustic grids and asymmetrical sculptures. She binds them with string or panel nails. They are not lanterns or lobster traps or bird cages, just shapes, nothing more. She tacks them around the house in ways she considers artful. When her dad's had enough of the clutter, he picks these pieces off the walls and tables and pitches them back into the woods, ready-made playgrounds for snakes. She hears the toilet, the water tap, footfalls. Come help peel potatoes, Leany. Before long, Daddy'll be home. Varlene rubs her belly, head bobbing. Hup, hup. Emma's fingers thrum against her own heart. She imagines wire encasing that fragile organ, a cage growing smaller as the weeks pass. Almost eight since her sister's last period. The luxury of time does not exist. Varlene crowds in beside Emma's elbow. Can we have sausages in a chain? the myriad creatures her sister evokes. A sea turtle, a duck with her flat, expanding feet. Sure we can, kiddo. She passes Varlene the peeler and a pan of grenade-sized potatoes, saving the smaller ones for herself. Be really careful with that. We're not in any race here, and try to keep the peels on the paper. Varlene begins a tuneless song about bees and buttercups. When she stops mid-verse, Emma knows she's unable to recall the words. We're big girls now, right, Em? Practically women, Emma says. Practically women, Varlene repeats. Emma opens the fridge, and a sour milk smell assaults her. Ooh, smell this. She holds the carton beneath Varlene's nose. It's like throw up, the girl says, and pinches her nostrils. Emma dumps the curdling milk. I'm almost done school now, and... Soon you'll be working full days at the opportunity shop. Hup, hup, Varlene says involuntarily. Steady there, Emma trains an eye on her sister's hands. She'll never control a pencil with them, Emma thinks. Beyond the fist-drawn scrawl, she considers her name. She'll never shift a gear or lace a shoe without struggle or appropriately count coins to pay for a lemonade. We don't want another accident. The family recently celebrated Varlene's 19th birthday with a red velvet cake, foil-wrapped quarters baked inside. Varlene nicked her finger, cutting the first slice. Why had they let her try? And the resultant caterwauling had Emma scrambling for the locked stash of feel-better sweets. After a Mars bar and a kiss on the Disney-bandaged wound, Varlene was impatient to blow out her candles. Look, Em, I've still got three boyfriends. Emma excused herself. It was getting too damn hard to keep it all in. Like this, right? Varlene conscientiously peels the warts off a potato. The skin curls and drops across an obituary in the Clayton Tribune. That's right, Leany girl, just like that. The windows rattle. A quarter-ton truck shivers before its engine subsides. Daddy's home! 
Marlene knocks the peelings off the counter. Ten steps on gravel and sighs at the threshold with his tin lunch pail and thermos, asking, How's my girls? Great, Daddy. Kisses? Varlene drapes around him, like a 1950s wife, Emma thinks. She studies her father, figures he's shrinking, a wick slowly burning down, the chemical process of combustion. She knows the mill's been chewing him up since he was 17 and eager to prove himself in his brother's outgrown overalls, knees already patched over twice. Hi, Pop. Supper won't be long. Smells mighty fine, he says, and kicks off his work boots. He hangs his hat on the nail by the door and slings gloves over the rungs of a stool. His hair is thick with sawdust. Varlene methodically retrieves the bottle that lives in the cupboard with the cooking oil, baking soda, a ten-pound bag of white flour, and grits. Emma sees how her sister's hair is much like a flame in this light. Varlene fills a coffee mug, handle, long gone, and passes it. Your medicine, Daddy. The year Emma turned five and Varlene seven, their mama packed up their suitcase, wrapped it in binder twine, and drove off with a flea market junker from Bristol, Virginia, without even stopping for a goodbye squeeze. Far as they know, she's living in some barn board shack in Tennessee now, or gone over Alabama way. That summer, their father took the girls to the swimming hole down from Betty's Creek Road, and on long picnics with barbecued chicken sandwiches and jars of sweet tea one could stand spoons in. The country circus arrived in Clayton. Trapeze artists with ample bosoms, Emma recalls, and holes the size of cooking apples in pink netted tights. The barking ringleader. And now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, a special treat for one lucky audience member. Who would like to be the first, the one and only, to ride Indira, the Indian elephant? Emmett joined the crowd of rural Baptists in raising the roof. The ringleader marched toward her on his white boots. I reckon this little lady will do just fine. He extended a ruby-ringed hand, but his small eyes and foreignness were terrifying, and she'd clung to her father, reaching for the fold of skin where a power saw had sheared his thumb at the knuckle. She'd made a habit of rubbing her own thumb across the smoothness, believing it a charm. Five tutoring sessions, and she knows some things now. Aside from his teaching position and desire to have his family experience another part of America, it was trees that brought Mr. Hamilton all the way from the West Coast. Georgia Pines. He's conducting a layman study which may become a paper on the southern pine beetle's cyclical and seemingly arbitrary nature. She has that memorized now, like she's memorized the periodic table of elements and the second law of thermodynamics. Entropy increases over time. Heat cannot flow on its own from an area of cold to an area of hot. Her teacher's researching how to anticipate the pine beetle's movement and thus suppress outbreaks in pine decimation. Teaching chemistry is something he fell into, he explains. Biology, that's where his true passion lies. She knows about his wife, a potter, and Midwest governor's daughter. Emma studies the framed photo on her teacher's desk, defined cheekbones, pointy chin, hair ordered back except for one long strand licked by wind. In another frame, the three of them, the daughter might be six, in white and navy, keeling on a sailboat like celebrities. California, land of dazzling teeth, magazine fashions, flawless skin, attributes reserved for the well-off and people who win total makeovers on TV. Out here, there's a lot of what folks call summer teeth. Some are here, some are there. She's tried not to gawk at his family's images or to imagine his sporty wife unbuttoning his shirt sliding the sleeves down arms that have never, she guesses, fed a log into a saw over hands that might not even know how to change a tire. But as useful as goose shit on a pump handle, that's what the good old boys would say about a high-collared man like this. It's like syrup, she thinks. Their relationship sugared into a slow pouring out of personal details ingeniously woven into the rich language of protons and electrons, chemiluminescence. Chemistry, for sure. 
In the classroom, they sit surrounded by the practicality of beakers, funnels, and autoclave. Fingers have touched across pages, and knees have met beneath his desk. At first he jerked away like he'd been electrocuted, but now, lingering. It's so easy, she thinks, and when it happens, and it must happen soon, it'll be a far cry from the saliva-drenched marathons with Judson and his cousin from Lexington, who claw at her like drowning men. Will he whisper, Emmeline, as the name appears on her school records? She's a long road from romantic but she wonders all the same. He and his perfect wife probably say thank you after having sex and read Wallace Stevens' poetry before clicking off the energy-saving lights. No back seats, no cleaning up with a dirty sock or stumbling out of the woods to rejoin the party and shotgun the next can of beer. Emma, are you following? The difference between ionic and covalent chemical bonds? Science, equations, enigmatic symbols floating up from the review he's prepared. No, she's not following. She still needs everything explained three times. Let's go over it again, please, she says, and looks up at him through her wispy bangs. I'm still not quite getting it. Tell me the circus story, Varlene orders. Emma's finished washing her sister's hair and is now combing it out on the bedside table. The circus story, Varlene's bestest. Emma reshapes the memory according to whim, adding a carnival, fireworks, sometimes an organ grinder, an imaginary trombonist, knock-kneed giraffes, tap-dancing three-legged men, deformed babies pickled in mason jars. In reality, it went like this. Come on, Emma, her father had said, his hand in the small of her back. It'll be fun. I'll come up with you. He and the small-eyed man escorted her to the platform and lifted her onto the elephant's huge tasseled back. I must not fall, she thought. She'd not been afraid of slamming the ground nor the inevitable crush beneath the elephant's plate-sized feet, but of the pain she might inflict were her daddy to lose her so soon after her mamma's mutiny. Emma recalls being led around the ring. The rocking motion, her embarrassment when the animal dropped a load and the crowd exploded in laughter. The stench of manure, a clown with red shoes dashing out with a shovel and pail. She dared a quick wave at Varlene, alone and panic-eyed in the bleachers, cotton candy making glue in her hair. And fortune tellers, Varlene asks, eyes round with expectation. Ouch! You're pulling, Emma. There surely were, Emma says, lifting her sister's hair and letting it slither through the comb's teeth with smoky crystal balls, also an alligator-skinned family and the fattest woman in the world wearing a crown like the queen. And polar bears? Barlene asks. You got that right, she says. Six of them. How about Elvis Presley? Emma can't help smiling. This is what her sister is good at. The preacher came by for a time. They listened while he made pronouncements from her mother's kitchen chair over raisin pie and pots of honeyed tea. Blame of oneself or others is a worm that festers in the soul, he said. His metaphor, Emma knows, was meant to speed size healing, but the message never took. When she was 14, her dad confided, how it had ripped him to ribbons, the way she'd tried filling the house with the sounds and spaces only a mother makes. My baby girl, barely able to see over the stove, and there you were, making a kind of stew. Time is a rigorous science. Emma adds up the weeks on her fingers. Two more have passed. Molecules, she thinks. Evaporation. She's on Betty's Creek Road, and ancient Charlie Dawkins, kin on her mama's side, is offering a ride. Almost home, she says, and waves him on, though the heat's now something to swim through. She'd love to stop at the swimming hole, where the preacher baptizes believers and they break out in tongues, but there are water moccasins, copperheads, rattlers, 
She plucks her blouse, quivers the damp cotton for relief. The humidity's made a ballast of her hair. She checks her watch, five o'clock, which means Varlene's had two hours of independence already, near about an hour too long, she calculates. Blame is a worm that festers in the soul. She damns her mamma, who spoke too loudly and brayed like a goat, her legs long and usually bare. All the other Baptist women knew how to dress proper for church. They wore nylons, even days you could fry an egg on a rock. Her mamma wasn't invited to study the Gospels or swap recipes in kitchens. She returned from church picnics with most of her potato salad going sour in the bowl. On the edge of everything, Emma thinks, kicking a stone from her path, that's where they existed. Edge of poverty, edge of the state, on the goddamned edge of decency. She's heard talk that her mamma needed it, like an animal or a man. Would have been better if she'd died like Mary Louise's mother, struck dead by a semi on the interstate. Mary Louise's mother had been elevated to the high status reserved only for those whose loved ones have suffered a tragic and too early death. It also helps, Emma knows, if the lost are beautiful. Well, even in soiled lace and hair slip sliding from bobby pins, her mama was undeniably that. She shifts her backpack and squints up the mountain, marveling at how the trees completely swallow houses and the dirt roads that wind through them. George is so thick and green, especially with the spring rains, ferns up to her armpits, Spanish moss jumping from oak to oak, sheltering bats and rat snakes and jumping spiders. Back in the day, women used the moss to stuff mattresses, or so they say and the trillium is in bloom. She'll collect some, float a few crimson blossoms in a bowl to cheer the kitchen. Strangers in a van speed past, too close. They honk and throw a beer can out the window, nailing a sign. She runs a finger inside her sneakers where her bare heels rub. There'll be blisters, she guesses. She inhales and holds her breath as long as she can. Some days he smells of rain, some days ginger, more like a woman than a man. Today's smell, dentine gum. Would you like one? He pushes the pack toward her, cuticles meet. She thinks about human chemistry, a science unchanged since Adam and Eve fled the garden, wearing nothing but heart-shaped leaves. She removes a stick of gum and places it on her tongue. Listen, Em. The increasing familiarity. Emma. Emmy. Em. She feels weightless. Yes, sir. Words trembling like leaves. Flying to California. Spending time with her sister. The weekend wide open, and go over the ninth chapter again. What she'd give to experience his perceptions. First day of class, someone asked if he'd ever been to the South before. Nope, he called it quaint and exotic. But George is divided, he quickly added, like every place, it's many worlds. Emma knows this is true. At flea markets, one can still buy Nazi candlestick holders, T-shirts addressing the war of northern aggression and Confederate flag belt buckles that disguise knives which could gut a man in one swipe. A few miles away, the same sun beats on international private schools, country clubs, estate homes with elaborate gardens and picture-perfect verandas sit next to shacks where piss-stained mattresses pile up outside yards like layers of a cake gone wrong. Garbage festers in the oppressive heat, and mangy hound dogs fight for the best bits. Y'all better not touch the back of that one, warns neighbor Danny, the nine-year-old who chases after anyone who happens by. Like she and Varlene, Danny's got no mama to love him proper, either. Teacher taps his pencil on the paper. Of course, if you're already studied out. No, let's do that, she says. That would be absolutely fine. Great, and M, you're almost a high school graduate now, I think. 
when we're alone, I'd like it if you'd call me Owen. He's closing books and smiling in what seems to her a careful way. Were the janitor to walk in and sight them among the test tubes and graduated cylinders, she believes he'd not sense a dang thing. I couldn't be everywhere all the time, she tells herself. She consoles as she butters bread for Varlene's brown bag sandwiches, and again while she boils water in a saucepan for tea. She tells herself this in the night, her sister mumbling in the neighboring twin bed, below gossip magazine photos of Brad Pitt. Blame is a worm. I couldn't be everywhere. Emma repeats this walking home from another tutoring session, and at the kitchen table, the small family clasping hands through the blessing out of habit more than belief, and as the sun slips behind the mist-wrapped mountains, somewhere someone's mowing a lawn, and she's learned something new again. Teacher's sheets are the color of marzipan and softer than human skin. Trees hem in the interstate. She can't see beyond them. There's another crush of clouds above, nine consecutive nocturnal rains. She loves listening to the force of nature, wondering if the house's foundation will hold or if they'll be pitched into the gap like a canoe down the Chattooga River. Varlene fidgets with the radio. Owen's car, lent for this day, finally here. Where are we going, Em? Hup! Atlanta. You already know that. We'll see a movie and eat in a restaurant. Anyone you want. But why are we going to the doctor? I ain't sick. She passes a jeep and gets well ahead before she returns to the right lane. She's not been this far from home since the eighth grade trip to Florida. Every few miles, real estate signs and billboards, new hotels, condominiums, golf courses and restaurants punctuate the green. It's not progress, she thinks, only change. Traffic's diverted near Tallulah Falls. Crews of migrant Mexicans curl over shovels and jackhammers. T-shirts soaked through as they widen the interstate. She slows enough to see brown eyes beneath hard hats. Judging her? Seems so. Emma intuits the immigrant's secret. This is not who they are. Owen's right. The South is divided. Across the state line, artists and writers have poured into Asheville, the Greenwich Village of the South, the papers call it. She's heard doctors and such are constructing multi-million dollar homes up in Highlands. Richie Richies who buy million dollar lake properties, tear them down, build again. A shitload of money's flooding into the mountains. You can buy fancy furniture and designer clothes right in Clayton now. And the change has come fast, like night sometimes sneaks up, she thinks, or sorrow. Teacher surprises her. He has disparate passions, collecting antique tools, fly fishing, and speaks to her like a longtime friend, like a lover. Easy to lose themselves in the kudzu vines that run wild in the wooded acres behind the school. They forget their real lives. She picks a small leaf from his hair and blows on it. He clasps her hand and brings it to his chest. I got in trouble today, he says. The principals warned me about propagating anti-Republican politics and anti-gun ideals. He's even come down on me about a Dr. Phil rant in the staff room. He laughs. They're beginning to laugh a lot together. Hey, look, he says, a pine warbler. Emma rolls onto her back. Birds dart between the treetops. Yellow breasts, cardinal red, merry songs. You've got something against... Dr. Phil? Her teacher hooks his leg over hers, the hair on his shins a soft carpet. I do. He's a moral entrepreneur on a mission to cure the ails of middle America with his right-wing ideologies, one televised family crisis at a time. Now there's a theory, Emma thinks. Keep talking, she says. 
I like the way you sound and the thoughts you think. He's already told her that when locals, your people, he'd said, cock their ears to his flat intonation and ask where he hails from, he's found it easier to answer, Virginia. The doctor is black, and a woman to boot. Owen, Emma thinks, would be pleased. The stranger takes Varlene's hand and leads her down a white hall, the girl's single braid swinging like a pendulum across her back. For a long time, Emma will remember this. Her sister does not even turn around. Homebound. The speed and multi-laned traffic, her unfamiliarity with the city, Emma grips the wheel like a life raft. It would not do to have to explain an accident. That would be trouble with a tail on it. Barlene's pale and unnervingly quiet, her palms flattened against the air vents. See that? Emma motions toward Turner Field. That's where the Atlanta Braves play. Would you like to see a game some day? We'd eat corn dogs and sing, take me out to the ball game. No response. The doctor promised she'd be back to herself in a day or two, good as new, short of a week. Well, everyone says it's super fun, Leany, almost better than the circus. Emma studies the interstate trees. They look entirely different from this direction. They continue north, passing Gwinnett County, Hall, Habersham. She reads signs aloud, dulcimers, guns and pawn, homemade jams and jellies. Traffic still held up near Tallulah Gorge, more Mexicans working the clay. On the radio, the opening fiddle strains of the Doobie Brothers' Blackwater. Turn it off, Em. Varlene. They drive a long time, the miles burning in silence. Mountain people have set up a roadside stand for quilts and vegetables outside Clayton. Someone's painted Isaiah 53 on a board and tacked it to a post. Five miles later, simply Jesus. From Los Angeles to this? Owen must feel like he stumbled onto a movie set, Emma thinks. Baptist revivals and Moses slabs pronouncing the Ten Commandments, and this part of the Peach State's tarnished by that scene from Deliverance. It'll never live down. Thirty minutes today. Time enough to spread the blanket on a moss bed. He trails his fingers up her inner arm and down between her breasts, making her shiver. She says, that feels like a spider. He stops then, and she senses it's going to get serious again. Em, you've got to tell your father and talk to the police. She contemplates the tricks of light through the pines. A cardinal swoops between branches as if on a string. That's my favorite bird, she says. Find out who and where, how long it had been going on. Teacher holds her chin between his thumb and forefinger. She can't look away. They should be charged, he says. He's talked about procuring an attorney, finding Varlene a safe place, a home, if that's what's required. It would kill her dad. Owen's paid for everything, and she's grateful as hell, but it doesn't follow that he should get some say. For all you know, Emma, he says, it's still happening. She sits up, reaches for her top. She speaks the native truth. It's not how we do things here. She does not attend her prom. And then the school bell rings for the last time. Summer. And she has a job. Her official title is research assistant. Much to learn about the southern pine beetle, and she finds most of it fascinating. Dendroctonus frontalis zimmerman, the most destructive insect pest of pine forests in 13 southeastern states and in parts of Mexico and Central America. Its name, she thinks, makes a pleasant little song. Owen says he thinks so too. <laughs> Ooh. 
a moon pie in its wrapper on the bedside table, Varlene's inert on her patchwork quilt beside a magazine spread, open but upside down. Emma dusts the white blonde hair off her sister's face, hovers a hand over her belly. A month behind them now, but heat comes through her palm as if it's rising off an element. Scarcely visible blue veins, no, something smaller than veins, she thinks, capillaries run like crazy maps beneath her sister's translucent eyelids. You have such pretty hair. You're our best girlfriend, Varlene. Was that the way? Two or three of them taking turns. There is that. Or the other thing. Dead tired of his life, of breathing sawdust, of trying to pretend it all doesn't hurt bad as a snake bite. By his steps, she knows he'll be at the window now, staring out, hurting and thinking, drinking whiskey. Emma takes the magazine off the bed. Scooch over, leany girl. Just five more minutes before lights out. She'll bring in the circus now. Unfold the old story like a tent. She'll make each word weightless, swinging. Even the elephant positively trapeze. That was my short story, Rabin County, published in my book, Listen Honey. Thank you for listening. You take good care now. How are you going to walk through this world? It's so easy to misstep.